Welcome to the Radiant Visalia podcast. Join us at one of our two services, 9 a.m. and 1045 a.m. Download the Church Center app or visit our website, radiantvisalia.com, to stay connected with us. All right, enjoy. You can grab a seat. My name is uh, Travis, and I'm one of the pastors here, and we are so glad that you're here. When we uh, put this tent up, we had this in mind, Uh, so... Thanks for uh, making this morning uh, special by being a part of it. Um, I'm going to start my, it's not a sermon, it's a sharing, because it's got to be 15 minutes, so I don't want to call it a sermon. Uh, I'm going to start this sharing with a question, and the question is this, if you can see a screen, um, do you know what this symbol is? The greater than, less than uh, symbol. I'm not sure if that's the official name, because I haven't had a math class in a really long time, but that's the working title. That's, where, that's what we're going to go with here this morning. Do you know how to use this bad boy? Of course you do. Because someone along the line taught you that that gator, that alligator, he's going to get the bigger fish. You may have been taught another method. I grew up on the gator method. And uh, it's right. (laughs) So here's how this works. When we put a couple numbers up here, we know that five is greater than two. But keep playing this game with me. What if we put up Michael Jordan and LeBron James? What happens when we put up Lord of the Rings and Harry Potter? Yes. What happens when we put this up is we know who needs to get saved this morning. Sean, who led us in worship, he was like, we could put up Star Wars and Star Trek. I was like, what? Putting those two names on the same screen? It's sick. Not my church. How about this? Mountains or beach? Keep playing. Here we go. Pepsi or Coke? Don't don't be the water person. You're like, well, I only drink water. We're we're trying to make a safe place for people here. Don't be that. Well, I don't know. I only have water from my hydro flask. All right, great. Here we go, kids. Flaming Hot Cheetos or Takis? Wow. So here's the idea. I think that we all know how this uh, symbol works. We don't always know what's of greater value. We know what this alligator does. We know what it's supposed to do. We don't always know what the bigger fish is. And I find this especially true in my thought life. I know what this gator does. I don't know uh, what it should go to. Everyone might be able to use this in math. Even if you're not good at math, we know how to use this in math. But I'm not sure that we know how to use this uh, in life. And I know as we gather here this morning, many of us might feel a little bit embarrassed about what what got our gator this year what we were turned towards, what got our energy, what got our attention. I know that the little things eat at me. The, le- the lesser things uh, get my gator. Sometimes I feel turned away from the weightier uh, things. It's not always true that I'm pointed towards what's most important. And again, I'm sure we're all a little bit embarrassed of what we've been turned towards or pointed towards this year. What a, a year we've had, right? 
What a year mentally. What a year physically. What a year economically. What a year emotionally. What a year racially. What a year politically. What a year nationally. What a year. What a year. In our heads, in our homes, in our places of work. So here's what I've been meditating on. Because if I'm honest, I've spent the year and I've been turned towards uh, certain things. And that's been, that's led to some despair. So here's what I've been meditating on. Here's the good news this morning. I've got, I've got, I guess, something good for your gator. I've got a bigger fish than maybe what you've been swimming after, right? The good news today is an announcement. It's not advice about what you should do. It's an announcement concerning what God has done in Christ. His life, his death, his resurrection has tons of implications for us, tons of applications for us. But here's the three that I've been stewing on this week concerning our salvation and concerning our struggles. His done is greater than our doing. I don't know if that's what got your gator this year, but his done is greater than our doing. Concerning the church, because we've been concerned for the church, Christ is greater than Christians. Still. Concerning our world and our future, our hope is greater than the here and now. Let me unpack these things a little bit. When I say his, his done is greater than your due, as many of you recall, it's Jesus. These are special moments for us as a family. As you recall, Jesus cries from the cross the words that we long to say and, and seldom hear. He cries from the cross, it's finished, done. We don't ever get to say it. Jesus says it from the cross, it's done. So the gospel, the good news this morning is not, hey, you can do better. It's that God has done something. Jesus lived the life you couldn't live. He died the death that you deserve. And now the work for us is to trust in his work. It's to believe in he who was sent, not to believe in yourself. That's not good news this morning. I don't know about you, uh, but I wake up thinking about what I need to do. I go to bed thinking about what I need to do. I wake up in the morning and I say I'm going to spend time with the Lord and I'm in a journal, but I spend time making a checklist, all the things that need to be addressed in my home and in the church. I go to bed with that same checklist in mind. What if we woke up thinking about, turned towards what he's done? What if we went to bed, turned towards what he's done? Oh, we would still do. We would still do, but we would do from a place of understanding what he's accomplished. Even as I began to prepare for this sermon, I started to feel all kinds of pressure because there'd be a lot of people here and everyone would be just nice. And it's so funny because so quickly I turned towards and was focused on and what was getting my greater than was what I needed to do. And I started to quickly get out of touch with what he's done, with what he's finished. So of course, I'm gonna get up here, I'm still gonna preach, but I'm gonna preach from a place of understanding the work is done. My job here is to trust in what Jesus has done. I'm not saying that what you do is not of value. What you do is of massive value. When I say that five is greater than two, I'm not saying two is of no value. I'm just saying five's of greater value. What he has done is of greater value than what you need to do, what you're supposed to do, what you've yet to do, what you failed to do. What he's done is greater. Don't let your attention be turned towards do. Let's spend our morning focused on done. It's enough for us. Let me give you just a little sampling this morning of what Jesus has done. I'm sure others could add to this. But help me out here. Jesus was punished. 
so that we would be forgiven. Jesus wounded so that we would be healed. Jesus made sin with our sin so that we might be made righteous with his righteousness. Jesus hangs naked in our shame so that he could, ma- he could raise many sons and daughters to glory, clothe us with glory. Jesus is cursed so that we are blessed. Jesus rejected so that we can be forever accepted. Jesus cut off so that we can be joined to the Father. And now he's risen, defeating Satan's sin and death. And now he holds the keys and all authority. So, yeah, he's done some things. And you're like, well, you don't understand. I've done some. Don't. That's like putting Star Wars and Star Trek on the same screen. Don't talk right now. Well, you don't understand. I've I've done some stuff. No, you don't understand. He's done some stuff. He's done some stuff. He's the propitiation for our sins. And not only for ours, but the sins of the whole world. He's done some stuff. If you were focused this year on your due, what you need to do, then you were in despair this year. Of course, it follows that Christ is greater than Christians then. If Christians got your energy and attention this year, then this was a tough year. Some synced up with our our culture, synced up with movements, synced up with parties in ways that was deeply disappointing. Some departed from the ways of Jesus in a way that was deeply disappointing. Some departed from the words of Jesus in a way that was deeply disappointing. If Christians got your gator this year, then this year was deeply disappointing. Jesus Christ is greater than Christians. This isn't the first year that he had a PR problem. This isn't the first year where his ambassadors didn't represent him well. Hypocrisy didn't just happen this last year, right? Hypocrisy is not a modern issue. It's a human issue. Hypocrisy is not an issue on the left. Hypocrisy is not an issue on the right. Hypocrisy, inconsistency, is an issue in us, in our hearts. And we've been sickened by the inconsistency this year. The double standard has got our gator. I don't care what side you're on. Here's what I want to say. Praise the consistency of King Jesus. Praise the leader who never told a lie. As a way of pointing you towards Jesus, I want you to know that Jesus hates hypocrisy. He doesn't wink at it. He doesn't tolerate it. He doesn't excuse it. It disgusts him. Jesus also experienced hypocrisy. He spent much of his ministry enduring it and confronting it. He saw the double standards for what they were. And he also worked with disciples who had double lives. Jesus predicted hypocrisy through his apostles. He said that his church would always be a mixed bag. It'd always be both wheat and weeds. It'd always be both true and false. It also would be both right and wrong. Jesus uses hypocrisy. I think for a lot of us, we are crying out, why can't we just have a pure church? Why can't we have that now? Well, I think it's because, I think the way he uses hypocrisy is to draw people to his grace and to make sure that you don't put your confidence in any human being who we just stated is a mixed bag. Here's the good news. Jesus will end hypocrisy. He'll end it. The day is coming when Jesus will separate the wheat from the weeds. He'll separate the sheep from the goats. He'll deal with the mix in us, the inconsistency in us, and he'll deal with the mix in our world. He'll gather up all the weeds from the field. They'll be burned, and he will have a pure bride without spot, blemish, or wrinkle. For some, what got your gator this year is what you've done or what you need to do. For others, what 
you've got your gator is what they've done and what they need to do. Both those things led to despair. Christ is greater than Christians. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author, perfecter of our faith. We follow him. We look to him. Our hope is greater than the here and now. If here and now got your attention and your energy, then this year was one of despair. Our hope is greater than the here and now. Christian hope, and I want to define this because hope so often is synonymous with wishful thinking. Christian hope is a realistic expectation and a joyful longing for a future good and glory that's based in the reliable words of God. A realistic expectation. That means this isn't like a student who's like hoping for the best because they didn't study for the test. Our hope is founded. Our hope is based in events. It's a joyful longing. You can have a realistic expectation that you're headed to work tomorrow. But there's no joyful longing to return to work tomorrow. It's a realistic expectation and a joyful longing. Christian hope anticipates. Christian hope looks forward. Christian hope longs for that thing to come even quicker. Come quickly, Lord. A future good and a future glory that far outweighs the trouble we faced in this life. That's ours. And this is based in God's reliable word. This hope is spelled out in detail in Scripture and sustained by Scripture. This is covenant and promise. Covenant's not contract, but it's not less than a contract. This is spelled out and sustained by God's word to us. Hope. It moves moves us forward. It diminishes the drag. Hope energizes the present. We live today in light of tomorrow. Hope fuels faith and faith fuels hope. Hope and the best followers and believers of Jesus are just hopers who won't let go. Hope is infectious. You can drag people down, that's true. You can also lift their spirits with hope. Hope is practical, like it works, it gets to work, it takes action. Hope is is healing. Depression is just an overwhelming sense of hopelessness. Hope is stabilizing. It's the anchor in the storm. In the catacombs, this is where Christians hid during Roman persecution for fear of losing their lives. In one cave, they found 45 anchors drawn on the wall. Hope is an anchor. Hope broadens your perspective. Negative emotions, they shut things down. When you begin to hope, possibility opens up. Hope purifies. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. One day we won't just be with Jesus. Here's the good news. We'll be like Jesus. We'll be like Jesus. And hope defends It's a helmet for your head in a time of war. Jesus is our hope. Our hope is on him. Our hope is in him. Jesus heals. Jesus saves. Jesus is practical. Jesus is that anchor. Jesus opens up possibility. Jesus energizes the present. Jesus motivates Our hope is in Jesus. Don't let your hope get hijacked by any person, by any nation, by any party, by any paycheck. Don't give your hope away. It's in him. Put your hope in him. 
the only one who will in the end not be shaken. Hope in Christ. We have a realistic expectation. We have, we have a realistic expectation that what happened to Jesus will happen to us. He's the firstborn of those raised. We have a joyful longing that the nations of the earth will become the nations of our God and King. Come quickly, Lord. We have a a future good and a glory that outweighs, that eclipses the trouble in this age. And this is based in the reliable word of God. He will perform his word. As Lori read earlier, he who did not spare his son, do you think he's messing around? Do you think he won't finish this? We have hope. Therefore, Romans 5 says, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God. That's through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we've gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our suffering, because we know that suffering produces a perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who's been given to us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But but God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we've now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the Through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we've now received reconciliation. We have the joy of baptizing people who are essentially saying what Jesus has done is greater than what I need to do, yet to do, supposed to do. I'm trusting in that. They're also saying that Christ is ultimate in their lives. They're also saying that they're pointing their attention not to what's present here, but the hope that is to come. So here's how baptisms work at Radiant. You've most likely seen a baptism uh, before. It's an ancient practice. It's as, it's as old as Christianity. And it's where someone makes a public confession of faith. And the person is essentially saying, I'm with Jesus. I'm with Jesus in his death. That's why we put him under. And I'm with Jesus in his abundant resurrection life. And that's why we bring them up out of the water. That's what uh, 22 people are going to do today in in Visalia. I think 11 in this service and 11 in the next. (laughs) And then five are actually doing it in Tulare. So this is a a great day for us. So here's here's your job. Exciting. Here's your job as a witness, because maybe you've never done this here at Radiant. Here's what we do. We shout, we circle, and we say. Those are the three things that we do together as witnesses. The reason we shout is because it's really uh, freeing at church. I don't know if you've ever done it at church before, but it feels good. Actually, we shout because all of heaven is rejoicing. All of heaven is shouting. We join heaven in rejoicing over what's happening here today. So when they come out of the water, we go ballistic. We all act like they're, we're their mom. That's what we do. And then we circle around them. We receive them into the body of Christ. We surround them during the last song and following the last song. We'll circle around them in support because they are. This isn't just an individual decision. They're making this public because they're a part of what we're doing. And so we circle around them and then we say 
We say what God's saying over them. If you remember Jesus' baptism, he comes up out of the water and the Father speaks over him. This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. So we say what the Father is saying over those who got baptized. So that's it. We shout, we circle, we say. We'll conclude our time in song uh, together. Make sure that you're not in the way of anyone's uh, relatives here to get a front row seat for this. Thanks for listening. We want to be a resource for you as you walk with Jesus. So please connect with us at radiantvicelia.com. Until next time. There is a heavenly city that I'm compelled to find. Oh, I love the flowers and trees and the smell of the grinding sea. And all the beautiful things here in life I'm a, I'm a pilgrim here on the side of the grave